10 list. These are things that hedge fund managers have actually said to us in the course of due diligence. Uh, we're going to try and put the quotes in context. Some of them uh, uh, border on the outrageous. Others are just downright silly. But the fascinating thing is, is these are things hedge fund managers actually say to us when you ask the right questions. So I'm going to start off. Number well, 10. I, I'd, like to, oh, uh, please. I'd like to thank the IAFB for organizing such a good uh, warm-up act. Um, I was figuring uh, that uh, Jim got paid a billion and a half dollars last year, probably worked uh, 40 hours a week, uh, 50 weeks. Uh, I, I did the math on that. It worked out to $750,000 an hour. Uh, and he basically probably took an hour to get here, an hour to get home, and was here for an hour on top of that. So that was $2.2 million of, of uh, warm-up acts that I'm I'm <laughs> pretty happy about that. <laughs> now, it might have been a little more efficient just to send the money and stay at home, but um, we appreciate we the effort. we distributed it to all of us. <laughs> right. With that in mind, I'm going to start off here. This is a, a quote that came from a, a group that came through Kelper's offices about three or four years ago, brand new uh, hedge fund. They'd been long only investors. Uh, they had never shorted before. And uh, I asked them what their fee structure was, and they said 2 and 20. And so I asked him, how can you as a neophyte hedge fund manager justify that? And this was their response. Number one, if we don't charge two and 20, no one will take us seriously. <laughs> now this is true. In the hedge fund world, if you don't charge two and 20, investors ask, oh my gosh, what's wrong with you? Why are you charging a lower fee? Now clearly, they had no track record by which they could justify this, but they thought that if they didn't charge it, it would raise more questions than their lack of track record would. So. Uh, Mark, Mark and I were in graduate school together, and it wasn't until a number of years afterwards that we both independently came upon the epiphany that you can pretty much sell anything if you charge enough. So that's what that one was all about. So. Uh, actually, I have three other quotes that I would have liked to have uh, included, which weren't said to me in my hedge funds, but are things that strike me as being truly profound, and, and they come from a paper that uh, we recently presented. Uh, the third quote was actually from Mark, but I'll, I'll let him uh, discuss what it was. I included the one you sent to me in the mail. But the first two uh, involved a, and this was a paper on risk management, a quote from Niels Bohr, who said um, that forecasting is very difficult, especially about the future. And the second one, which struck me as being um, much more lucid and much more profound, was actually from, uh, I was watching a press conference with Mike Tyson before a fight. And one of the reporters was asking him about his, um, his fight plan and uh, about his opponent's fight plan. And he basically said that everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the head. And I thought that was um, <laughs> somehow really and truly profound. So somehow that's, that's my <laughs> right. And, and as someone who's involved in portfolio construction and risk management, that struck me as being uh, deeply insightful. Uh, in any event, so first quote, um, I, I don't remember what I said. Oh. Uh, oh, yes, we're, we're market neutral. Uh, and this was said uh, in the process of a meeting which was then promptly rescheduled because he claimed the markets were choppy and he had to go to attend to them. <laughs> so they're uh, market neutral, uh, by the way, um, being a finance guy, it has a, it's a very precisely defined term of art. It certainly doesn't mean neutral to the market. Absolutely. Uh, a lot of hedge fund managers would like you to believe that. Uh, my next quote is from a hedge fund manager. This is one that was in CalPERS portfolio. They were an equity long short manager. And they were, they massively outperformed the market in 2000, 2001, 2002. We all remember that. That was a three year bear market. So when I stopped in to do a due diligence trip and catch up with what they were doing, I noticed that they were sitting on an awful lot of cash. And this was their explanation for that. We are 75% cash because we can't find sufficient investments. Now, this is bad on so many levels. It's hard to know where to begin. <laughs> First, how are they outperforming the market, even though they were equity long short? Well, they were just sitting on cash while the rest of the market went down. It doesn't take a genius to figure that out. But they were charging me 2 and 20 for sitting on cash balances. Now, think the, about that. This is a problem my wife would never have, by the way. <laughs> 2 and 20 <laughs> to sit on cash is not the way you want to manage your cash. Furthermore, managing a, a large portfolio, that's, that's my decision to decide how much cash should be sat on. So basically what happened here is this equity long short manager turned into a market timer and all they did was sit on a ton of cash during the three bear market years, outperformed the market massively, collected great incentive fees on that, 
and basically went home smiling with a, a smile on their face. We terminated them shortly thereafter. Uh, as far as I know, they maybe still are sitting on 75% cash because they can't find sufficient investments. Oh, and by the way, if you can't find sufficient investments, give the money back to your investors. Don't sit on it and charge them 2 and 20 for holding cash. That sounds like a pretty good plan to me, actually. Um, oh, there's no risk. It's arbitrage. Um, this is a word It's sort of French-sounding and uh, kind of sophisticated. And uh, it's generally expected to mean some, a scenario where you're buying something here and selling it here at the exact same time and doing things riskly, uh, risklessly. Um, of course, that doesn't happen anymore. And I think a lot of people confuse the idea of, of risk-free or arbitrage is essentially just taking the risk of a low probability event where hopefully you'll earn your incentive fees and bought a Ferrari before if that happens and, and you don't have to give your incentive fees back. So that, that's sort of an issue uh, for me. So. The next one comes from an uh, extremely well-known, very large hedge fund manager. Again, this is back when I was at Kelpers. They came through our offices to offer us the opportunity to invest in their funds, much like this gentleman in the, in the back there was suggesting. Uh, I asked them what their fee structure was, and this is the response I got. We charge 3 and 30 because that's the only way we can keep our assets under several billion dollars. <laughs> Now stop and think about that response. It doesn't say anything in here about their performance or why they're a great hedge fund manager. And what it really tells you is this hedge fund manager had changed the direction of their fund. They were no longer about wealth generation. They were about fee generation. And it gets back to Andy's comment. The market you know, will bear the price of just about anything. Consumers will buy anything as long as you charge enough for it. And here's a case in point where they were charging 3 and 30. Again, not because that justified any superior investment process just the way they wanted to do it so they could generate the most amount of fees. Uh, we're closed, uh, which was followed by a, a request on my part, can we give you an additional $300 million? And they said, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what I've discovered is, except with the case of Jim Simons uh, and one or two others, that closed basically means you're open, and open means you can't raise money. And uh, <laughs> so I had a conversation with a uh, – very successful guy out on the West Coast. Uh, that's an expert, by the way. It's, it's a guy from out of town. And uh, he, he was telling me that he'd, he'd, uh, he'd talked with his wife, and his wife is a psychiatrist, and she'd come to him and said, look, you're never going to be successful um, un until you close the fund. You have $250 million under management, so he closes it. And uh, within the next 18 months, he went to $2 billion under management. So it's not a bad strategy. <laughs> Out of curiosity, have you tried that yet? <laughs> I'm closed. <laughs> <laughs> my, my next comment is one I've heard, uh, I want to say dozens of times, probably it's only a dozen times, uh, particularly from equity long short managers. I've heard this so many times that I've decided to include on my top ten list. We don't invest in crowded shorts. Now, I've heard this, I, I want to say dozens of times. Now, come on. We all know crowded shorts exist. Uh, without crowded shorts, there wouldn't be any short squeezes, there wouldn't be any beta expansion. We wouldn't see increases in volatility. We wouldn't see the prime brokers charging higher and higher rates for a particular stock when you want to borrow it. Crowded shorts exist. So if there are any hedge fund managers out there who use this in their marketing literature, strike it out, because we all know it's out there. And, and I've heard this so many times that it must be a figment of my imagination when I do see the crowded short. I'm not going to touch that. <laughs> OK. Um, uh, we're looking for a few strategic investors. And this, of course, is not true. Uh, it is, it's not something you want. Um, and maybe I could just give a little sort of insight into uh, the closest I've ever come to seeing a, uh, a c controlled scientific experiment in finance, which happened about two years ago at Merrill Lynch, uh, where um, we had these two managers. I'll call manager A the, the control group and manager B the experimental group. And the control group uh, basically had this idea that he wanted eight to ten investors that would, you know, deep-pocketed, experienced, patient, long time horizon, this, that, and the other. Um, and he had about a billion and a half under management. And basically what happened that during the month of July, there's nothing much going on in the markets. He was just a bit above flat on the year, which probably made him top quartile, given that was sort of a rough point for global macro managers. One of his investors pulled, which then caused them to have to go back to, I believe it was the UBS pension fund, who said, look, you know, we love you, but we can't run the risk that we end up being more than 20% of your assets, for even for a brief period of time, because then we got to consolidate you onto our balance sheet. You don't want that, and we don't want that, so we're out. 
which then knocked Goldman out, which then knocked us out, which da da da. In the th space of three weeks, with absolutely nothing going on, uh, they went from almost a billion and a half under management to less than 50 million and had to shut the place down. Right. So that's kind of my control group. The exper experimental group is a, um, another manager who is a CTA who shall remain nameless, um, who also had an account um, with, at, at Merrill, uh, about a billion and a half under management, um, was down about 26% on the year in July of that year, finishes the year down 24% with more money at the end of the year than he started with at the beginning of the year. And you ask yourself, how is this possible? And it's possible because an account had been set up where they'd created essentially a public offering. And he had a large number of investors who were qualified investors in very much the same way that people, did you ever watch those ads for the Lowman's Auto Group where you need like $99 and a job? Um, that was essentially the, um, the same <laughs> qualification. And so he had lots of investors. Now, does anyone want to take a guess as to how many Investors, we can have a two-way market here. Does anyone start the bidding? How many, sir, do you think were invested in this fund? And I preface it by saying you're probably going to guess low. Uh, two thousand. Okay. Any? Do we have another bid out there or an offer? Does anyone? Ten thousand. Is that a bid or an offer? <laughs> okay. We got a two-way market. Two by ten. Uh, anyone else, sir? <laughs> he knows the answer, so he can shut up. Okay. The answer is uh, forty thousand. Okay, and that's 40,000 independent and identically distributed decision makers who never fought, have the following conversation, oh my God, Mitch Thurn has pulled uh, his money from this fund, therefore I'm going to have to consolidate it onto the balance sheet of my dental practice. Okay, that simply doesn't happen. So this is uh, really kind of an interesting scenario where you can tell just by looking at that there is probably some relationship between the concentration of your capital structure and the probability for any experience level of volatility that you actually remain in business. So took one of our uh, PhDs and set him to the task of building a model. And he did two things. First of all, link up that relationship to understand just how powerful it was. And second of all, take it one step further. What is the relationship between the concentration of capital structure and the enterprise value, because the enterprise value is essentially the probabilities that you stay in business multiplied by the present discounted value of your future management incentive fees. And it turns out you're moving from eight to 40,000, you more than triple the value of your business. It's pretty interesting. So um, the reality is um, you're not looking for a few strategic investors. You're looking for investors who, you know, and the only way I can figure it out how he ended up with more money at the end of the year when, when he started is that 30% of the investors might have been uh, estates that were in probate, because <laughs> uh, there's no reason the money should have stayed there. Uh, all right, so that's. It was dentists. <laughs> yeah. The next uh, quote on my list goes back to number 10, and this is the same neophyte group that came through CalPERS a few years back, studying their hedge fund for the first time. And I asked them, point blank, look, you're going to go equity long short. Where did you learn to short? And I got this response from one of the managers. I haven't charted before, but I do have my CFA. <laughs> now, I am a CFA charter holder, too. But that doesn't qualify you necessarily to short. But this gives you a sense of some of the naivete of, of people out there who believe they can just go out and short. Uh, and, and I'm sure I stay away from crowded shorts on top of it. Go ahead. I seek them out. OK. Um, I hate risk systems. All they ever tell you is how not to make money. Uh, I'll let that one stand on its own. <laughs> All right, I'm going on to uh, number five. This came from a managed futures manager who made this comment at a large investment conference like this. He said, managed futures are a better investment than hedge funds because hedge funds are a zero-sum game. Now stop and think <laughs> about that. On every side of a winning trade, there's a loser. It doesn't matter whether it's in managed futures or in hedge funds. And the fact that this guy just didn't get that, and he was managing a, a managed futures fund, lead you to, to doubt the credibility, you know? But it was fascinating because he, he made the comment to a room like this at a very sophisticated uh, group of hedge fund investors. Chess is a uh, zero-sum game. Okay, here we go. Uh, our new fee structure is zero and 98. It may seem high, but remember, we don't make money unless you do. Uh, <laughs> 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 Interestingly <laughs> enough, this <laughs> 
this Can was, I invest? <laughs> yeah. This was Cliff Asnes, and basically what had happened was he'd had a psychotic episode and sent out a newsletter. Um, and he had said, uh, basically, uh, if I can remember some of the other parts of the letter, uh, basically went on to say that, look, we've received a lot of criticism, that our newsletters aren't up to their normal, insightful self, so we've decided not to issue newsletters anymore. We'll just concentrate on trading, and uh, we're not going to report on any performance. Uh, and then he mentioned this. He also said you don't have to choose between a high risk adjusted returns and, and liquidity that they're going to issue debit cards so that when you're in the uh, in the mall you can actually get stuff uh, and I wrote back saying uh, that his his um, candor was was uh, truly inspiring and so I'd send out a newsletter to our investors saying that we actually don't do risk management because it's just too difficult <laughs> 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 and they bought that. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, next on my list, again, uh, this is a, a different group, but uh, again, a Neofit group that came through CalPERS about four years or so ago, startup hedge fund, and they brought along with them their top attorney. This is a lovable bunch of group from Texas. So these lovable Texans came into our office. They were introduced through a board member of CalPERS. They were starting up their hedge fund, looking to raise the first money. They had with them their, their, their new top attorney from a powerful law firm in Houston. And they came in and I asked them, are you going to do, um, are you going to have both onshore and offshore investors? They assured me, absolutely, we're going to have both onshore and offshore. I asked then, how are you going to resolve the conflict of interest between how you'll allocate those trades? And their top lawyer, this, again, this partner from this powerful law firm said, well, that's a good question. I then asked, well, had you thought about constructing a master trust to deal with this? I got back this response. What's a master trust? <laughs> and as I began to explain to this lawyer what a master trust was, he literally took open his, his briefcase, opened it up, took out one of these legal, yellow legal pads that lawyers always carry, and began to take notes as I lectured. And I was sitting here thinking, they want to charge me 2 and 20 and I'm giving them the education. We didn't invest with this group. Uh, I'm sure that uh, they might have been a, as, bu as brilliant as Jim Simons, but their lawyer certainly didn't know about anything about the infrastructure of how this fund was going to get set up. Oh, this was pretty interesting. Um, we had a uh, manager on um, a conference call with some of the investors, and we're trying to get him to explain why his performance had been so bad recently. And he said, um, it's your fault you allocated too much to the sector. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was really creative. <laughs> And I solved the problem pretty quickly, too. <laughs> <laughs> My next quote goes back to the same lovable group of Texans. They came in, again, this is a startup hedge fund. They hadn't managed hedge fund money before. They were raising capital. They were looking for an anchor investor. Right. And in their own words, they were going to do, in this one hedge fund, they were going to do convertible bond arbitrage, merger arbitrage, managed futures, corporate governance, and equity long short investing all five strategies in one hedge fund. They're going to be a multi-strategy hedge fund straight out of the gate, never having managed hedge fund money before. Now, as I mentioned just a moment ago, I turned them down. They were looking for 100 to 200 million, and I, I basically set them on my way with a very polite saying, guys, you need to get your infrastructure organized, figure out your best strategy, go with that first, and then maybe later we'll talk. Well, at the time I did this, I was the head of global equity for CalPERS. That was the position I got hired into. And I was promoted to be the chief investment officer a year later. But after I turned them down, they were so disappointed, they sent a letter to the CalPERS chief investment officer. And the letter started with this opening line. I still have the letter. <laughs> Your head of equity doesn't understand our hedge fund strategy. Now, there was one big problem with this letter. Between the time they wrote it and mailed it to CalPERS, the prior CIO had resigned and I'd been promoted. <laughs> I never did give money to these guys, never heard from them again, never knew what happened to them. Somewhere to my wife doesn't understand the answer. Yeah, okay. that thing is um, falls. <laughs> oh, this is great. Uh, this was in a newsletter. Uh, bold actions allow us to make fewer decisions, which increases the value of each decision. Uh, so there's sort of a conservation of wisdom principle here. That I, uh, <laughs> My next one uh, comes from due diligence I was doing on a hedge fund manager in London. 
And as you do due diligence, you, open, you ask open-ended questions. We all do this. Uh, I'm sure everyone in the audience has done that, just to get people to start talking and so you get a sense of what they do. And so when I ask an open-ended question, what I'm hoping to do is just open up the discussion broadly so I can start to collect the information and just begin to filter it through the due diligence. So one of my open-ended questions is very simply, what's your investment strategy? You know, how's it that you make money? You know, what's, what makes you so smart and bright? I never expected to get this response. Basically, I look at trading screens all day and go with my gut. <laughs> that was his stated investment strategy. Now, the fascinating thing is, is this guy, when I looked at him, wasn't too long ago, he had about 125 million sterling under management. Uh, so about 250 million US. So clearly, there's a lot of people out there willing to just trust this guy's gut. But you have to think about it. What happens when his gut gets indigestion? <laughs> or he goes on vacation, whose gut replaces his? This is not the way to develop a rigorous investment program. Actually, this is uh, kismet here. Because uh, this same group of people that uh, provided me with insight number three, uh, I think on the same day when they managed to break into that bag of uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors and get high. Uh, they came up with this one as well. Uh, we often follow our guts. We are, after all, not gutless. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if you visited the same hedge fund that I, I did be, the next yeah. day. Big fat guy? Yeah. <laughs> right. All right, my, my, uh, my number one top 10 quote goes uh, to a hedge fund manager that I'd visited out in Connecticut, and it's not Cliff Asmus, so let's <laughs> put that aside. But I'd been out there to visit, due diligence trip out in, uh, out in uh, Greenwich, visiting with the hedge fund manager. And I went in there right on time, showed up at my scheduled time, it was 10 in the morning, and I'm sitting there in their ante room in their lobby waiting, and waiting, and waiting. Finally, 25 minutes after the appointed time I was supposed to meet with the hedge fund manager, I'm thinking, all right, it's getting a little out of hand. I'm here representing a large investor. What's going on? And I'm thinking, well, maybe he's in the middle of a big trade, or he's negotiating some swap agreement, or right now they've got some, some key issue they've got to deal with in risk management. So that's why I'm waiting. So I went up to ask the receptionist again how much longer this is going to be. And I got this response from her. He will be with you in a minute, sir. He's still meeting with his architect. <laughs> now, it's everyone's God-given right to have a nice house. And indeed, when I did finally get into his office, there he was at, at his desk with all these architectural drawings of his new house, this McMansion he was building in Greenwich. But that also told me exactly where I stood with this hedge fund manager and also what was most important on his mind. It was not talking to a new investor, it wasn't going through his investment strategy, it was building his new house. Now. When you find a hedge fund manager like that that's beginning to enjoy the finer things of life to the point where they're not willing to meet promptly with a new client, you have to start to ask yourselves, are they more about wealth generation at this point or wealth preservation? Clearly, this hedge fund manager was moving over to wealth preservation. He just wanted to flatline, keep what he had, and enjoy his new house. And the last one. Uh, my, my favorite, it's not quite as crafty as that one, but... Um, Yeah, we were talking to a manager who said that uh, about imposing risk limits. We can't accept risk limits. We're a wild stallion that must run free. <laughs> uh, I never thought I'd hear that. And uh, so we established some really wide boundaries for within which to operate, and he promptly hit them. Uh, I got hit by a truck in his first month, so um, he ran wild and free. <laughs> All right. <laughs> With that, thank you. You've been a very patient audience. Thank you very audience. much. We hope this has been fun today. Just want to thank everyone for staying to the end. Uh, some of the uh, videos will be up in a few weeks, and some of the slides will be up in the next few days. Uh, thanks again to Bear Stearns for hosting us and to our sponsors. Uh, please join us for the reception outside. Thank you. Mm -hmm.